This is the Decibel Geek Podcast with Chris Sinzak and Aaron Camaro. Man, we've been rocking all year long and we're coming up on the end of 2021, but we still got a lot of butt to kick before we get through this year. This is the Decibel Geek Podcast back with you this week once again to have a good time and talk about rock and roll. My name is Aaron Camaro. I'm one of the hosts. That means there's two of us, and the other one is this man right here, my friend, Chris Sinzak. How you doing, brother? Good. Had a good turkey day, did you? Yes, man. So much to be thankful for, and spending time with family is about the best it gets for me, so I know it's the same for you. Yeah, it was a, it was a great weekend. Uh, had uh, our son and his new wife in town, and loved her and she uh, met the whole family's approval i'm sure it was nerve-wracking for her but uh <laughs> we had a good time and uh the last full night they were here we we all went downtown to dinner and have haven't been to downtown nashville in a while and i remember why now yeah it gets a little crazy down there but that's awesome man that's good to hear that yeah ace even came over and sat down and had a grateful meal with us. So it was a good Thanksgiving. I hope everybody out there listening to this had an awesome Thanksgiving. I know a lot of people were very thankful for the episode we came out with last week, which was Michael Wagner's final interview, part one. And so you know that today we're bringing you part two, and you're going to love it. But before we get to all that, let's take care of some business. And I see right here, after such an awesome episode last week, we've got to have some reviews, some really good ones, five stars. And I look and we don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish I had better news for you. Well, that's the way it goes sometimes. You know, if you guys want to leave us a review, there's three great ways to do it. You can do it on Apple Podcasts. You can do it on Podchaser.com, which is an awesome website. And you can leave us Facebook recommendations. We like those too. But I know we did get some awesome comments on our Facebook page about last week's episode, part one with Michael. Nate Atchison, our awesome friend Bushy, he says, great episode, even with the technical difficulties. That (laughs) stuff happens, guys. No worries. Can't wait for part two. And then, of course, right after that, Shane (laughs) Hebert, he posts a couple of pictures of Space Invaders. And I was like, yep, that's the sound. I was trying to figure it out. Pretty dead on with what it sounded like. Yeah. Guess what? Not a lot of that this week. This week, it's all cleared up. We got it under control. Awesome one on here from Michael Heese. And he says he met Michael in the mid to late 80s when he produced the first Brighton Rock, Young, Wild, and Free album. Grew up with some of the band members, and they invited some of us to sit in on the recording process. They all loved Michael Wagner. Awesome. Rob Birchmeyer says, awesome show. By far the best producer interview I've ever heard. Damn. Decibel Geek knocked it out of the park. Great work and looking forward to the second part. Patrick Breen says, Michael Wagner is now my favorite all-time member of Accept. (laughs) (laughs) Great work. Looking forward to part two. And that's what we got in store for you today. So thanks to everybody that took the time to get on the Facebook with us and talk about last week's episode. There's going to be plenty to talk about this week because we're back with more. So we want to thank everybody that did one special thing for us last week. They found the original post on Facebook or the tweet on Twitter. They retweeted it. They shared it and helped us get the word out about Michael Wagner's very last interview on the internet. People that do that, well, hell. They're Geeks of the Week. Geeks of the Week this week are Adam Cox, Rock and Ron Runyon, Rob Birchmeyer, Eric Kluber, Paul Peace, Matt Ashcraft, Cobras and Fire Podcast, Baco, Aaron Baker, Simon Cat, Pantheon Podcast, Joseph Capone, John Phillips, Keith Rockford, Shay Hargett, David Glenn, Mark and Jerry BS Sessions, Mark Alden Taylor, Jeffrey Mendenhall, Jay Shablewski, Mike Parnell, Sit and Spin with Joe, Steve, Lil Willie, A to Z, Mikhail Burrell, Doug Fox, Kevin's on Fire, JJP, Body of the Soul, Vet Halen, Eladio, Ernesto Aguiar, JJ McElhenney, Kristen Schimbeck, David Cathy, Scott Crouch, and as always, the, the Mo- Mooger Fooger. Yeah, lots of extra love going out to the Fugers this week. Yes, definitely. So, the time has come. This one 
It's all about you. Because in part two, we're asking him all the questions that you guys sent into us when we asked you. This is the last one. Is there anything you want to ask Michael Wagner? Well, our people, our rock and roll friends all over the world really came through for us and had some amazing questions that we were excited to ask Michael. And he's awesome, so he's going to answer them all. So if you're ready, I'm ready. Here we go one last time. The very final interview with the one and only Michael Wagner. Here's a really good one from David Hudson from Digital Killed the Radio Star. He wants to know what is being said in German on Warren's bitter pill. Um, I have to see if I can get it together, but it's basically saying life is a bitter pill, a bitter pill, a bitter pill. It's, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. It's just saying things. Yeah. You know, and and um, Jenny wanted me to do something in German, and you know. I'm in front of a microphone. I'm as bad as I am on stage. But, uh, you know, we had a good time there, so I did it. Um, <laughs> God, that was in 1990. Around there, yeah. 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 Were you like, Janie, why do you want me to do this? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> but that's that kind of, that's a lot of times that people yeah. want me to say something in German. Yeah. And, and, and mostly it's eins, zwei, drei, vier, counting into a song, yeah. you know, but he wanted, he had that whole part written. And, and uh, uh, sometimes when you translate stuff from English into German, it doesn't really work yeah. that well. And yeah. That was one of those, yeah. you know. But there was something German, so it was okay. That's yeah. such a great song. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, See, that was another record where, where I thought it would have been massive. Should have been. Yeah. You know, it's and an and, and they record. would say, awesome. "Oh, that's our best record ever." And, oh, it's totally their best yeah. record. And then rock moved to Canada for a while, and and you know we had all the grunge come out, and yeah. and then they on the album cover in leather shorts, and uh, that was un- unlucky to you yeah. know. So, uh, but yeah, I would have expected a lot more from that record. Well, when we came out here to do Albums Unleashed, what was the first album we asked you to talk yeah, about? That's that was right. Dog Eat Dog. And it's, and it's one of our most popular episodes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like it, oh, yeah. did, was, it may not have been a great success, but in hindsight, it's like a cult favorite. You know, oh, people yeah, just for love sure. it. And on the other hand, Janie passed away. Yeah. If he would have gone on writing songs and making music, that album would have probably been bigger at some point. Yeah, I think so. You know, too. if they could have followed it up with his songs and stuff. Unfortunately, that wasn't yeah. wasn't meant to be. His his natural writing talent was something yeah. else. and he's singing and a great yeah. singer you know? too. The song "Sad Teresa" that's on there, like that that song goes back to their club days. It mm-hmm. was like one of their the fans' favorite. But like, obviously, they were making a, an effort to change a little bit of their sound be more serious on that record but sad teresa is a little bit of a throwback to an earlier time do you remember why they decided to throw that one on there it was just they one just of the songs it. that we had in the list yeah. you know we probably had like about 20 songs when we started pre-production mm-hmm. then we picked the the best 10 yeah. or 11 I, I can't remember for the record yeah so that was one of them. Yeah, no deep, real. And and to me, it's you know when I go into pre-production, I never know who wrote the song, mm-hmm. who in the band wrote the song, or where it came from, or whatever. I just go, I like that. That's a good song. Let's put that on the record. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's how that probably worked. Right. <laughs> uh, top player, Dudeski. I called him Dudeski. What's the top player's name? For Warren. Yeah. Joey Allen? Yeah, Joey. Uh, there was that song, Hole in the Wall. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. I remember when we went into those apartments in Tampa where we did the record, he had a football helmet, 
and he created the hole in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> he just ran into the wall, oh, you know, and that stuff would happen all the time. Yeah. You know, it's like, wow, how could you not like that? Well, yeah. you, got, you have to keep yourself entertained. <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> Here's one from James Ryan. He said, uh, you mixed Overkill under the influence and Testament Low. I'd like to just know any thoughts or memories of these albums that you mixed. He said, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions about Warren's Dog Eat Dog, (laughs) but I'd really like to know about Low. He thinks it was a very underrated Testament album. Uh, Low, which I asked... Chuck and and I go. What does it mean, Low? He goes lunch on Wagner. So <laughs> that was the original name for the record. But you know, a New Testament from before. We just got to got together and did this ever. There's never really any thoughts behind it. Yeah. You know, we we got along. They liked what I did sound wise, and and so it was also very very early. Does it say when it came out? Uh, uh, 93 or 4, I think. Maybe earlier. I'll tell you, I got your discography. 93 or 4? I had it on cassette when it was new. Was See, it? Testament Low came out in 94, and Overkill was... That was before. Yeah, that was before. That was way before. That was back yeah. in 88. But Low, well, I thought it would have been later, because I moved to, to Nashville in 96, and I remember Testament being in my studio as one of the first bands, but I think that was Demonic. Okay. Mm-hmm. That album that came out, yeah. You know where Around we uh, where we uh, uh, <laughs> counted backwards. We had a machine counting backwards. You know, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, and it got stuck. Six, six, six. I swear to God. Oh my That's God. That's what happened. <laughs> and they all looked at me and go, keep that. You know? <laughs> wow. Isn't that weird? That is weird. On an album called Demonic. That's right. Yeah. Right. yeah. You can't, yeah. Yeah, you Only can't in plan a studio that out. with Testament does yeah. something like that happen. On an, you know. And so, yeah. and then, you know, we all, I did some other stuff live at the Fillmore or something like that. Yeah. I did with them as well. We always, you know. Is your approach to a heavier band like that? Because we're talking about Overkill and Testament. Them are two like real heavy metal mm-hmm. bands. Does your approach change with something like that as oh. opposed to doing like To a- me, it's like uh, I didn't record those, you know? Right. So I've been given tracks, and I treat the tracks like I feel they should be. And then we fix them like the band thinks it should be, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and like... Master puppets take all the reverb off. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and and uh, uh, and that's what the result is in the end. Yeah, you know, yeah. but my influence is surely on there, mm-hmm. and yeah. and and it meshes together with their influence, of course. Yeah, well, yeah, low is a it's got Megadeth. A, it's got a well. giant sound. Yeah, too. Megadeth too. Alex Skolnick, great player, great. Yeah, you know, and Chuck Billy's a hell of a singer. Yeah, I love Testament. I've really gotten back into them again. I listened to them a little bit when I was younger, but here lately I've been just grabbing every Testament CD I can find, and everything is really good. Well, them, like Striper, still putting out really good music yeah. today. Yeah. yeah. I remember Low we did in L.A. That's right, 94, and I had an airplane. I was flying my own airplane at the time, and Chuck would go, can you fly me up to San Francisco on Sunday to see my son? And I go, sure, let's do that. So we did that. We flew up to San Francisco or wherever mm-hmm. in that area Bay he area. was. And then uh, we fly back. And we fly back down the coast of California, uh, Big Sur and all that. And it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And I'm flying and Chuck's sitting right next to me. And all of a sudden I hear... This is your last flight. And I look at Chuck and say, what did you say? He go, I didn't say anything. And then I kind of like watched him out of the corner of my eye, and I hear again in my headphones, this is your last flight. He go, Chuck. He goes, I didn't say anything, and he didn't hear anything either. You know, so... Sold the plane the next day. Oh, for <laughs> real? Wow. <laughs> yes. 
I don't know if she'd be hanging around with the Testament guys. This whole uh, yeah, ten nine eight six 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 six. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That was that was so That's funny. creepy. But imagine that with a with a metal band like that. Yeah, you know, and and the thing starts counting down and it gets stuck on six. That's creepy. Wow. And everybody's looking at each other like, keep that. <laughs> All right, here's one from Jason Kearney. He sa- Hi, Jason. He asks, what was the most satisfying project for you ever to work on? What was one or more projects where you wish you had more time or money budget to work with? What's most, if you had to pick one, your whole career, your most satisfying album, like this is the greatest thing I've ever done. That I can't tell you. Yeah. Because if there would be only one, then I didn't have the right job. Yeah, you, know, you got I, many. Every, every, pretty, pretty much every single record I did, I loved. Mm-hmm. You know, and and there was there was some that went a little bit easier, some that went a little bit more complicated, and 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 but I loved them all. Yeah. And and if I had one, where I would say. That one stood out a little bit. I would have said it was No More Tears. Yeah. yeah. You know, because Ozzy is such a such a great person and such a character, yeah. you know. And and he's a character 24 hours a day. And 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 he's not acting. He is that character. <laughs> and and uh, same as Alice Cooper. Yeah. You know, it's he's he's the character. But I Pretty much loved every record I've done, and that to, to say that after fifty years of a career, yeah. you know, it's like wow, man, I had a great life. Yes, yeah. Never mind the, all the vacations I missed, but yeah, this was great. Yeah. You know, but I mean, no more tears. That's that's one of those albums where the planets really aligned for everything, well, right? Yeah. And I didn't even record that. Yeah, it was recorded and produced three times before. Really? Yeah, by the time label came to me, can you do better? And you can always do better if you have a sample already. Yeah. you know, and Ozzy didn't want to like it. He was he was in England. And they got me the song No More Tears to mix, and he was in England in his house, and he goes, I got a twenty thousand dollars stereo. Everything sounds good on that. Yeah, you know. So, and then they invited him to New York to the office, and they played him the two versions there, and he says, "I had to agree. This one was better." Mm-hmm. And then he called me up. He went to Hawaii on vacation, and he called me up and goes, "Do do do me a fucking great mix, or 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 I set you on fire." <laughs> <laughs> I have that somewhere on a on a on a phone call on a wow. tape. Wow! Oh god! Yeah. No, I I like a lot. I like a lot of bass on my record. So do me a fucking good mix, or I'll set you on fire. <laughs> wow! And of That's course, awesome. I use that little bit. I, I set you on fire and put that on the record. Yeah. Set you on fire. Set you on fire. Set. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You can get inspiration from the littlest things. You yeah. Know. yeah. But, uh, yeah, that, that's wild. When you get the call originally that says, hey, Alice Cooper wants to work with you, is that something that you hang up the phone and kind of jump up and down you're excited about? Well, it came together a little bit over time because Kane Roberts was in Alice's band. Right, you and did him first, with right? Kane, yeah. And and Kane's like, well, I'm going to ask Alice if he wants to. And the first thing I did was remixing uh, Constrictor. Mm-hmm. That okay. was done somewhere in New York. You know, and, and and I remixed it because nobody was happy with what was going on. And it was a lot of work because <laughs> it was my first introduction to MIDI. Oh, okay. And, you know, so we kind of replaced the drums that were played with a drum machine uh, sound. Okay. Not the, not the timing, but... The drum machine, of course, has its own timing, so it would go out of sync with a with a with a song all the time. So we called it tabuk tabak, because it was tabuk tabak tabuk tabak tabuk. Oh wow! <laughs> so um, and and me and Midi didn't get along because 
Kane would say, I just walked into into the studio and your head was smoking. <laughs> I go, come on. He goes, it's literally smoking. That's how that came together. You know, and then and Alice was in the studio and trying to teach me golf. Oh, boy. <laughs> and it took about five minutes. He goes, never mind. <laughs> It's like you're not gonna pick up on no. this. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's an important time in his career. You know, he was reestablishing himself after a lot of right, a lot of down years. And right, and, dark and stuff. it went really well on that record. Yeah, you know, but there was a lot of stuff that was still a little plasticky on there mm -hmm. because it was a redo of something, and then you know, Shep Gordon and Kane and everybody decided you should produce Raise Your Fist and Yell. Did you have very much interaction with Shep? Yeah, Shep was Shep was was involved in some point. Yeah, you know, and and, and Shep is one of the great yeah, uh, he, uh, uh, managers. His story is incredible. Yeah, yeah. and and then he would uh, he would give you a little hint, you know, and and you better follow that hint <laughs> in your mix or something like that. Yeah, and and he's always right. He yeah. was always right, and I admire him a lot. Yeah, a lot. And you know, there's uh, not that many great managers. You yeah, know, Shep is definitely one of them. Did you see the uh, documentary about him? Yeah, That's I a, have the book. And yeah, and it's an amazing that. story. Nice. Yeah, yeah, what a life he's lived. Yeah. yeah. All right, here's one from David B. Hope. Oh, I know David. You know him. I did a Apocalyptic record with him. Lovers. Yeah. yeah, I mixed an album for him yeah. or with him. He says, you've worked with so many bands we all know and love, but was there one band that got away? You know, one he'd always hoped to work with, but something always messed it up and kept it from happening. Well, of course. Nothing, nobody messed it up. It just didn't come together. ACDC. Yeah. Was my, there ever any my closeness? Favorite band. There was a close thing <coughs> where I was in Germany doing a... <coughs> Uh, Russian roulette with accept. It's great. So and that I was booked for that, mm. so I was gone, and I got a call about doing flick of the switch. Oh man! Yeah. Uh, in the Bahamas, and I was in twenty five minus Germany, yeah. you know, freezing my ass off and and doing Russian roulette. But you know, a commitment is a commitment. Yeah. And uh, so it never came together. But ACDC is my favorite band. Yeah. The old ACDC, and 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 I would have loved to work with them. You know. What's the best ACDC album, and why is it Power Age? Back in Black. Yeah, it's Power Age. I, I mean, my favorite I'm is just, Back in Black. I'm just with you. Back in Black's amazing. Yeah. 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 It's like that's when I said, you know, and and that was it. I mean, I in Germany when I had my own studio, Tennessee studio in yeah. Hamburg. Uh, How ironic is that you wind up here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and uh, uh, I had the labels come to me, and they would give me records, and I would transfer songs of those records onto a cassette for their meeting. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, ACDC, um, the one before Back in Black. Highway to Hell. Highway to Hell was the first time I heard them in 79, oh, wow. and I go, oh! Holy shit! Yeah. You know? and, and so I got to hear those songs, those records, before they were released. Oh, wow. You know? And uh, that was just like blowing my mind. And, and then they came out with Back and Black after that, and, and it, it floored me. I mean, not, not to least that, uh, to Matt Lang, you know, who did an amazing job yeah. you know, and, and became my idol right away there. But uh, back in black, it, it's just that that comes on, and I'm I'm in a good mood. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it'll lift your spirits. It's just like whoa, and if I got like new speakers or anything new in here, back in black was always what I would try it with. Nice. That's that cool. and uh, British Steel. Yeah. Yeah. Great album. Can you talk about like Mutt Lang and how he became your hero? Did you ever get to meet him? No. Never? Unfortunately, never did. Oh, wow. I worked with Roy, who was another one of my idols. Yeah. You know, obviously on, uh, on the second Dawkins album. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Tooth and Nail? Yeah. 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 Tooth and Nail. And, and 
It was funny, man. It was very, very funny. Roy was mixing it, and, and but Don wanted me in there because we were friends and I was his security blanket, you know. Uh, obviously, against somebody like Roy Thomas Baker, who was I? Right. You know? So... Uh, Roy mixed it, and, and then the band comes in, and Roy goes, we got everything, just not the toms. We haven't done the toms yet. And they all listen, and George Lynch, the first thing he says, I hate the toms. <laughs> so Roy took all the feet, pulled them all down, you know, and he looks at me and goes, whatever you do with those metal bands, just do it with them. Wow. That was it, so I got to mix the whole rest of the record. You know, but I got to learn, got to meet Roy, and, and of course, my first question on Roy was, backing vocals, Queen, what you do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he explained it to me, and you know, so, and we became good friends. I actually ended up marrying his secretary back then. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and what a character he is, too. He is a character. <laughs> he is a, quite a character. I have some some stories about him throwing parties and Motley Crue being at the parties and oh. all hell breaking loose on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but that was the time, you know. Excessive yeah. was the time. Here's yeah. uh, one from Grayson Gallegos, a listener. Uh, he says Dave Grohl loved and bought the mixing board from Sound City, the Neve console. Right. Is there a mixing board or piece of recording equipment that you would like to own for either the historical value or for the memories? Historical value, the red console from Abbey Road yeah, that the yeah, Beatles worked on. One. But a mixing console is a mixing console, and, mm -hmm. you know, this is what the, the ears is what goes with it to make it work. Right. You know, yeah, I've been, I've worked on that, on that console as well mm -hmm. at Sound City, and it was a it was a good console, but also the room was amazing. Yeah, you know the studio looked like Hendrix would come out of the wall any second. <laughs> but it it was you know, and a friend of mine who later worked at Amigo uh, was the manager, at, or actually worked at Amigo before, and later on managed Sound City. Um, you know, and, and and it was a great studio. Yeah. I don't know if I would go and spend a million dollars, or I don't know how much it was, on a console just because, mm. you know. But, I mean, Dave Grohl is no uh, no amateur at all. He right. knows what he's talking about, so yeah. he must have had his reason. Yeah. On the other hand, I think if you have something a setup <laughs> like that and you take the console out of it, Mm -hmm. It all changes. Yeah. yeah, you know they lost some of the magic when it went out yeah. the door. Yeah, but there's definitely differences between consoles. Sure. Yeah. Did you ever work in New York, like Electric Lady, or? I, I went to Electric Lady and, and heard all the stories about yeah. Hendrix and you know, but I've never worked there. I worked in New York, Union Studios or something like that, mm -hmm. but not that much. Oh, okay. So. Right on. Uh, Ryan Sessions, we already talked about Striper a little bit, but he wants to know about, any thoughts about your time working with King's X? Oh, yeah, King's X. Um, my manager at the time was uh, Doc Thaler, who was also together with uh, Doc McGee, yeah. the manager for yeah. Skid Row, and, and, and Megadeth, Scorpions, Kiss, uh, K Kiss yeah. and, you know, and, and a whole bunch of bands. And uh, Doc Taylor, after, way after he was my manager, at some point called me up and said, King's X is playing the exit in here in Nashville. Why don't you go down and see if you can hook up with him? You know? So I did. And we did hook up and, and, and uh, got to do two records together. Uh -huh. Were you familiar with them before you went and seen them, or was a that little your first? Bit, yeah. A little okay. bit, but I was not as familiar as to know how amazing that band is. Yeah, oh, man. You know, really they amazing. Blew my mind. Yeah, you they, have to they, see they would go, "Okay, we need another song," and he goes, J "Just record something two track." You know, on, on, on two tracks, and they're set in their control room with a little drum drum pad mm -hmm. and, and the bass and the guitar, and they would go through songs, and at the end of this, we had the song. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. With, with, with uh, Ty, it's like 
could you try this? No, he didn't try it. He just played it. Yeah. You know? Unbelievable, this, this band and the harmonies and, and yeah. the, everything that came together, the vibe in, in the studio, you know. We did one song, I think it was, was it All Right? It was one song where we did the drums in the tracking room in my old studio, which was a small room. And then we did another, and we did it with my usual method of 20 microphones. Mm -hmm. Then we did it with a method of three microphones. And then we did it outside in the parking lot. And we were going to cut all those parts together. Okay, the verse is in that room, mm -hmm. and, and so on, so on, so on. Oh, wow. And, but it was 95 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes... I didn't feel too well playing out in that parking lot, and, and you know, he yeah. didn't feel good about the take. So yeah. We, we end, not ended up using it. Mm -hmm. So you tried it. But the band is just. Oh, they're uh, amazing. Floors me. Yeah. yeah. Floors me. I love that Ogre Tones record you did with yeah. them. Yeah. That's a great And record. you go see them live, and you hear the record. Yeah. I mean, to the T, mm -hmm. with three people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. One of our three female listeners had a question. <laughs> One of the three yeah. female. There you go with yeah. heavy metal. Yeah, it's a, it's a sausage yeah. convention. Mostly, yeah. mostly guys with both three of cheeks. Uh -huh. <laughs> Khaki shorts and black t-shirts. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, this one is from Kristen. And she wants to know, is there an album of yours that you wish you could do a do-over on? Hmm. I can't think of yeah, it. Yeah, that's what I thought. When she I asked that question, I thought, what a great question. I bet the answer is no. Because you worked on an album, even though it was expensive to go into a studio back then, so you did a long pre-production until everybody knew what they were doing once they got into the studio. I mean, Slave to the Grind, that song was the demo. Yeah. It was the original demo. We recorded and mixed in one hour, you know, and that's on the record. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's awesome. so you did pre production, and, and that means you were happy with what everybody was playing. And then you would work to the point where everything they played would feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and even though it was expensive, but you had to pay for the whole day. So we had 24 hours, you know, and and more than once we used those 24 hours, yeah. you know, and, and, and recorded and recorded and recorded till we liked it. And so by the end of the record, when it was mastered and when it was done, you liked it. Yeah. So a do-over, no. No, I mean, we did no. the Raven all for one. It was 11 songs. We did it in 11 days, complete. Jeez. Yeah. Saigon Kick, the first record I did with them, uh, 14 songs, 14 days, complete. Wow. Wow. But these bands rehearsed 10 hours a day. Yeah, they had their stuff together. Yeah. yeah. They would go in the studio and they played everything, including the guitar solo <laughs> and the vocals at the same time, you know, which was rare in, in many cases. What, so, well, to leapfrog off that question, was that with your mixing, was there ever time where you were pushed up against a deadline, like the album's got to get turned into the record company, and you didn't feel you were finished mixing? No. They always gave you enough time to, no. do, to do what you wanted to yeah, do. Yeah, because mixing, for some reason, it always turned out, it's a song a day. Mm -hmm. You know, I would start mm -hmm. uh, in the morning mixing a song by about... Six, seven o'clock, it would pretty much be done. I took it home and listened at home on a different stereo uh, to see if the feel was the same. Mm -hmm. And then went back the next morning, fixed a couple of little things, and the song was done. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was rarely, and not on one of my productions, but sometimes on a production that I got just the files for, that I used more than one song. Mm -hmm. and, and in the end, you know, when everything was digital, um, it was more than once that there was I mixed two or three songs in one day. Yeah. Because doing the doing the recordings, uh, you already 
kind of like get your mix together in the computer. Mm -hmm. And since it kept all that forever, you know, the actual mix was done pretty quickly. Gotcha. And when you do a mix like that, I got to imagine, like, once you get one song down, because the rest were all recorded basically the, in the same format, once you get one down, the rest got to come pretty easy after that, um, right? That goes for the drums. Okay. You know, when if we did the drums in here, um, you don't change too much in between drum recordings. You change the snare, you put a different snare, you put a different cymbal here and there, you know, but you don't change completely the whole drum sound. Okay. So in general, number one, all the instruments are on the same track. Right. So if that's a kick drum track, that's a kick drum track. So and if you get a sound for the kick drum, you know, uh, you also don't necessarily change the sound for the kick drum. If you have a great sound on it, you keep it. Yeah. So that in that you're absolutely right, you know, but the overall drum, like the rooms mm -hmm. and stuff on it, that gets changed depending on, on the song. Okay. You know, and sometimes you use more room to make it a little bit more trashy, you know, and sometimes less to make it more in your face. Which I rarely did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah, so uh, but guitars, for instance, it's always different from song to song. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Bass kind of like might stay in the same, you know, especially if you have great bass players like Rachel or Peter Baltus, or, right. you know, and it's like, who have the same age bass, by the way, 59, mm. uh. pre-bass. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh! <laughs> I suppose that gives the songs on the whole album gives them more of a feeling of these belong together then too. Yeah, yeah. And Peter played on played on uh, Jack's Hollow too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great so, job. so we get we got. She is like could easily move a little bit into the country direction, mm -hmm. which is not allowed in my studio. Because <laughs> the only country walking in here was under your shoes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and and so Jack's. It's kind of tough with her songs, you know, and the meaning of the songs are kind of tough. So I go, I need a tough bass player, Peter. Peter is the guy, yeah. you know, and then I need an almost punk drummer, mm -hmm. which was Angie yeah. from, from uh, Taco Mouth yeah. or Dead Deads, you know, and, and uh, uh, that combination was very, very lucky. Yeah, gave it, a, gave it a unique sound. Yeah, really yeah. Did. Well, so you mentioned you know no country in here. So uh, one thing I was looking up was you know you did uh, engineer work on the uh, Janet Jackson Black Cat single. Right. Oh, you so, mean the greatest Janet Jackson song yeah, of all time? Well, for sure. <laughs> Which obviously has a big rock sound, and I'm sure that's yeah, why you were asked to do that. it. I love that. That's exactly why. Because I know Nikki was co-writer on that, right? Or did she he, wanted yeah. to cross over into rock. Yeah. And the album was already out. Yeah. You know, and then, and then they needed a, a, a mix for the single and for the video and, and so on, so on. But did, uh, with that experience, did, was it a conscious decision to stay in the rock game? Like, were you ever tempted to stretch into, like, pop or something different? Um, I probably did some borderline pop. Yeah. Right? I, I, I would have to look it up, but, but I just did... I never took a band, except for X, and tried to make it different from what they were. Right. You know, that means um, if, it was, if it was country or uh, rap, I wouldn't do it. Right. Because yeah. I would completely change it. I actually turned down Ronnie James Dio back then because I would have changed too much on his songs. Oh, yeah? So it would have still, it would have not been Dio anymore. Oh, wow. And we agreed on that. You know, I was at his house, and, and we talked about it, and we agreed on that. And he goes, I honor that you do that that way. Oh, that's cool. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that is neat. What album would it have been? Uh, that one with the English kid as a guitar player. Rowan Robertson? I, I don't know his name. Was I that, can't remember his I name. I think so. That was Lock Up the Lock Wolves. Lock Up the Wolves, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when 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 was that? Early nineties. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. And know you're not just going to take a gig just because of the money or something, or you know, right. say, oh, I did a Dio album. Right. If you really didn't feel like, but that's crazy too. I mean, you don't feel like you could have worked together with him to. 
that seems strange. The songs where, in a way, for instance, the drums sounded like they were played by a guitar player. Well, who was a drummer? Oh, uh, for Dio back then? Oh, that would have been... Uh, I don't think Vinny was still in the band then. No. Was it Bobby Rondinelli? That's what I'm thinking. No, that, I no, don't think no. so. It was... Ap Ap Vinny Apathy? I think so. Really? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. He might have still been with them then, yeah. Yeah. And and it was like every guitar fill was played on the drums. And and I would have changed all that. The uh, drums okay. would have been straight like accompaniment. Well, that does sound like Vinny. He likes to do a lot of fills. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And and and, uh, and I talked to Ronnie, and, and, and we talked about it. And I said, would you like that to be changed? He goes, not really. So yeah. we okay. ended up agreeing on that. We should not do it together. That's good. It would have been cool to hear you guys work together. That yeah, would have been yeah, cool, too. Yeah. He was a cool guy. Yeah. He was a that. very cool guy. I wish I could have met him. Yeah. Oh. I got one here from Mark Johansson. This is a pretty interesting question. I have never heard this before. He says, Extremes Pornography. Rumor has it that Nuno pretty much had the album covered production-wise, but the label insisted that a producer be involved. How much did Michael Wagner actually contribute to Porno Graffiti, if at all? In general, that is correct. Nuno had, or the whole band, had worked the album out, you know, and, and the label wanted me in there because I had a good name and, and stuff like that. I can't tell you exactly how much was done because I was involved. I know that all the sound was made on my back. Yeah. You know, I, I made the sound, I, I got the drum sounds and all that. There was a couple of songs, they were already done, and we kept them, yeah. you know. And, and from the arrangements and stuff like that, it was all figured out. Yeah. I didn't do much, you know. I just liked the songs, and, and let's call it that way, I kind of brought them to life. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, and you hear that when you hear the previous and the next album that Nuno produced, uh, you can hear the difference in that direction. The songs are all great. Yeah. You know, so, and, and the arrange, arrangements are all, because Nuno is just amazing. Yeah. You know, he played yeah. on Janet Jackson's song as well. Did he? Yeah. I didn't know that. On was Black that. Cat. Oh. Um, <laughs> we got, that was at the time, analog tape. We got to stack this high just with drum takes oh my for God. that one song. Wow. I think there was 23 different drum takes wow. played by different drummers and, and, and. So, and then there was uh, Vernon Reed played a solo all the way through the song, which we kind of like shortened a lot. And then the rhythm tracks, I asked Nuno if he could play the rhythm tracks. So Nuno Betancourt wow. and Vernon Reed are playing on that song? Yes. I wow. had no idea. Yes. I and probably five other burning. people that <laughs> didn't make it into the mix. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. A couple of guitar titans right there on, yeah. on that song, on a Janet Jackson song. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. I had that on cassette tape, on cassette. I think I did too. Yeah. On cassette, because I didn't want any other Janet Jackson songs except for that Some, one. No, I have the extreme on cassette. Yeah. Did you get to talk much to Janet when you were working very on it? Very briefly. Yeah. Very briefly. Janet was Nuno's idol. Oh, really? You know, he loved her and, and her music and all that kind of stuff. So when she came in to listen to the song with her 20 people <laughs> her entourage. crowd, you know, <laughs> she listened to the song. We got to talk about 10 minutes after that, and, and that was kind of it. Oh, okay. You know, and... and, and uh, uh, and nine out of the ten minutes Nuno took up. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. talking, bending her ear about everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, um, yeah, but, yeah, that was, and Nuno, of course, did a great job. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. And, and it basically changed the whole song into, like, fun forward rock song. Because that's know? what I love about it. Well, it's the most rock and roll pop song yeah. probably yeah. ever made. Wow. It's the only Janet Jackson I've ever purchased. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you you purchased the, uh, the half halftime video. Oh too. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. He likes Black Cat and wardrobe malfunctions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh man. That's awesome. Well, we've covered just a lot. What else have we got? Um, 
We got all day, guys. Okay. I have no time limit. Bill Elam says, congratulations on your retirement, Michael Wagner. Your work has had an immense impact on us listeners and would not have been the same without your contribution. Wow. My question, what is the most common lesson you have gotten across to artists that brought the direction of their particular project into focus and, in your opinion, changed the project for the better? So I guess what he's asking is, what's the most common lesson you have gotten across to artists that brought the direction of their particular project into focus? Well, you know, when when you get together with artists and you start working with an artist, they always look for advice from you, what to do and, and, and what not to do. And my, my main advice always was, be yourself. Yeah. Don't make your music after anybody else. Mm-hmm. There's a ton of people that did that and failed completely. Yeah. You know, even big bands, mm-hmm. you know, that, that oh, now it's, 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 it's grunge out there. Now we have to be grunge. And they did grunge and completely failed yeah. because nobody wanted to hear that. Well, people don't right. buy it if you're not being yourself. Right. And yeah. again, ACDC never did that. No. And they were successful, you know, someone has said to Angus, you did 19 records, they are all the same. You know, and Angus said, that's not true. We did 20 records that are all the same. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, be yourself. Have your own thoughts. Have your own, present your own feel Mm -hmm. to something, you know. Don't try to uh, uh, tailor you yourself after anybody else yeah that to me was always the most important thing yeah well kind of on that note you know you were talking and you were mentioning nuno you know kind of bugging janet jackson about stuff so would you have you know bands that you would bring in like say in the 90s or whatever that grew up listening to Dawkins or skid row or whatever and then just biting your ear off wanting to know answers and questions about working with those bands um it was more like Hey, can we can we have the Skid Row bass sound? Yeah. Or can we have the George Lynch guitar sound? And I would go, yeah, here's his number. Call yeah. him up. Because yeah. the only way you get that sound is when yeah. he plays. Are you gonna it. bring his fingers yeah. in here? Yeah. <laughs> and and you know that that's uh, with the invention of of all those guitar preamps and in the camper, you know, where actually his amp was in there. Yeah. And it's you know, I had. I had, uh, what did we do? I think it was White Lion. We did White Lion at Amigo. And we had that setup, that guitar setup of Vito's. And then somebody else came in after us, and the producer asked me, and it was a band that was known at the time. And the producer asked me, can you leave that set up and can I use it? Mm-hmm. And they used it. Sounded completely different. Yeah. yeah. Completely different. And, you know, it's obviously not Vito playing. Right. It's, it's, it doesn't matter anymore what you use, you know. Even though we used that ADA guitar preamp mm-hmm. on Skit Row, White Lion, and Extreme. Yeah, and yeah. there's three bands that are completely different. <coughs> yeah, totally different. yeah, and it's and it's the same. I so <coughs> Scotty from Skate Row bought it. Yeah, the the one that we used. I still had it here. And it was a, a setting forty five mm-hmm. that was used on every single band, exactly the same. And they all sound completely different. Yeah, you know, so it doesn't really matter. It's all in the fingers. Mm-hmm. That's like buying the Michael Jordan sneakers and thinking you're going to be able to <laughs> right. do all the dunks. Jump eight, jump eight yeah. feet. Yeah, he, yeah. he may wear those and you wear those, but that's where it is. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> I'm here with my guitar, Michael. Make me sound like George Lynch. Yeah. Right. Good luck with that. Right. And of course, you have certain things, certain ways. Well, George holds the pick like that. Try that. And. And and you get maybe a little bit of it, yeah. But but never. It, it yeah. will always, you know. I can tell George after one bar. Yeah. Oh, that's George. Yeah. Playing, no matter what song it is, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, be yourself. Be your own, be your own and do your own thing. I do have I to like say, it. this is our last interview with you. It still bums me out that we're not going to get to do an album's unleashed on the dysfunctional album. Yeah. Because <laughs> no, I know you have stories. I'm actually pretty. 
eggs and glad about that. I know you are. You turned us down the last time we asked you. I mean, yeah, because yeah, I, I love that album. But if you look at the history of what's going on with Dokken, I mean, it seemed like they just kind of got back together for I don't even know why. Because I don't think they even got along then, did no. they? No. Never, because there's two characters that are very strong, and and you know, I don't know what it was between the two that they they just had to fight in order to fight. Yeah, yeah. you know, and and uh, dysfunctional. Um, George wasn't even in the band when we started that album. Really? You know, who was doing and, the guitar work? Yeah. Hmm? Who was on guitar at that point then? Later. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we did the drums. And we did the drums on a different, we think, I think we did the drums on a one-inch eight-track or something like that. I, I can't remember. Was it 16-track? Something like that. And then we did the drums, and then uh, uh, Jeff came and played the bass and did some vocals, and I went away. Then I came back, and when I came back, probably after like two or three weeks, George was back in the band. Hmm. And then George had played a bunch of guitars, but to the wrong drums. Oh, wow. And I mean, Dysfunctional is the perfect name for that record. <laughs> so now I had to go and, and, and fix those guitar tracks with the right drums, yeah. you know? And, wow. and uh, It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. It I still was still like the record. Yeah, yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah, it came out in the end. It came it came out great. It's a cool record. But mm. but uh, I probably lost ten years of my life. Oh really? <laughs> wow. Mm. You still have your hair though. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't pull it all out. I think with those two guys, do you think it's the tension that maybe makes them rise a little better? Do you think it works for them? I think the tension was actually a positive thing in the relationship, in the band, yeah. you know? It made everything a little bit more tense and, and aggressive. It, it's kind of weird because I read, I just read a book written about Dawkins in, in the early years. Mm -hmm. and, and I have some comments in that book as well. And when I hear all the other guys talking about that time and seeing what and how they remembered stuff, and I was definitely sober in, in that time and, mm. you know, probably might remember stuff slightly different. Oh. And on the other hand, I probably didn't know some of the stuff that happened in America while I was in Germany. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's stuff been going on. But what was happening in Germany, I know about, you know. And, and uh, I know that we rehearsed for Breaking the Chains, rehearsed in a wine cellar, you know, and it was damp in that wine cellar, so the Marshall cabinets had mold in it, and so did the Tom Toms, you oh, know? Yeah. It was all, uh, and Mick had two of the same size Tom, two 13-inch Toms, and with mold in it, and mm. just all that kind of stuff happened, you know? And uh, they came over and they brought their stroke tuners, mm -hmm. which are based on 60 hertz mains power, and in Germany it's 50 hertz. Yeah. So okay. after three days, Everything was out of tune. Oh, and then Don's in the middle of a room. He looks around. I was the engineer. And Don goes, looks at me, goes, you're the producer now. I go, that'll be $5,000. He goes, you got it. That's how I got my first wow. production. Wow. <laughs> and it went gold. Uh, you know? yeah. So great record. I love that record. Yes. Yeah. Another one that Peter so, Baltus played all the bass on. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. You mentioned the book. That was a the Nothing But a Good Time book that yeah. has all the quotes from people. No, that book was actually only about Only Dawkins. about Dawkins. Oh, yeah. okay. Because I, I was reading Nothing But a Good Time on vacation. That you're, is funny. You're, you're quoted in that a few yeah. times. But I have like, it on, on uh, audio book. Audio book. Yeah, but, like the, but Dawkins is one of those bands It's like they were snake bit from day one. Like there was always tension, always drama. Great band had great results from it, but like... <laughs> They were in the story. They're talking like George, apparently George told Don like we can name the band, but it's not going to be called Dawkin. Then he leaves. Then he comes back. Well, the band's called Dawkin. It was called Don Dawkin. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was Don Dawkin. Don Dawkin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was on the record. Yeah. Like and apparently George was not happy about, no, about that at all. Of course not. I wouldn't have been. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
But it's those two. It's but see, kind I of didn't a, know all that. Oh, I'm to sure. To me, it was, oh, okay, it's talking. But it's like those, it's a miracle those two work together as long as they did. Yeah. I mean, because they're, they're like oil and water. Yeah. They're totally different people. Yeah. But I don't know, but, you know, <laughs> and I was always in between. Yeah. You know, That's I was not a fun place to really be. good friends with Don, <laughs> and I was friends with George. I was friends with everybody in the band. Yeah. And then today, Mick was on Don's side, you know, and then and Jeff was on George's side, oh, and man. tomorrow Jeff was on John, Don's side. It's like, oh, God. so what, what's going to be today? Wow. Probably felt like their mother half the time. I mean, for Anna Lock and Key, we had a, um, a co-producer. Neil Kernan, mm -hmm. who did Autograph. He okay. did Turn Up the Radio. I love that there you are, biggest producer huge, of the world. Huge yeah. you know? And he was the producer. And again, Don said, I want Michael in there. So I was a co we were, we were co producers. And we were in rehearsal. And Don, uh, John, uh, George didn't show up for like three days. Shows up on day four, walks into rehearsal, walks straight up to Neil, and goes, we don't want to sound like autograph, and walks back out. <laughs> that was it for the day of rehearsal. Wow. You know? Oh, my it God. Was, it was like that the whole time. Did you ever get treated like, oh, you're just Don Dawkins' guy? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Uh, when, when, whenever that seemed to be the case, whenever I was his, I was of his opinion, you know, Mm. But I never saw it that way. It might have been because Don brought me over and, and gave me a place to stay. And, right. and, you know, so it might have been that I had a good relationship there, but I didn't know George, uh, didn't know Mick, and, and didn't know Jeff. I mean, when I met met the band, it was Juan Cruz, he was the bass player. That's right. You know, and Greg Pekka was the drummer. Hmm. And that's when we did that, that demo, uh, and then we did it in different nights at Tennessee Studios. Mm -hmm. And then the, the owners of Tennessee Studio uh, thought that they should get paid for the time, and they released that as a bootleg. And it went to number two in England. Wow. <laughs> wow. I still have it here. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. I saw one question we saw from uh, Grayson. He had said, uh, "How how important? It may may not be important at all today, but how important do you think sequencing is in an album?" Well, uh, today it doesn't matter yeah. because you go online and you they pick the best song, put it first. Yep. If you like that song, you listen to the second. If you like that, you listen to the third. But that's kind of like where it ends, yeah. you know. Back then, you had to buy a whole album and you listen to a whole album. Yeah, right. And an album, when you sit there, you actually took time to listen to that album, and that the album took you through a certain mood, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And that was that sequencing was important then. Yeah. It was very important. It was always like that. The third song was a kind of a ballad. Yeah. You know, and then it picked heavy or fast song number one. Yeah. Got to come them over the, the head. Yeah. yeah. And, and then uh, uh, go through the ballad and then pick back up. And then the last song on the, on the record was a, a song with a really rememberable chorus. Yeah. So when you went away from it, you still had that song in your head. Yeah. yeah. Would you make that call a lot, or did the band? A lot of times I, I worked with them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I worked it out. You know, it depends on the band. Yeah. Bands like Skid Row, we decided everything together. Oh, sure. Was Doc McGee very much involved in any Yes. Of yeah. Yeah. He always had a say in some of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, Doc is uh, the other manager yeah. that I think is unbelievable. Yeah. You know? Unbelievable. And, 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 and Doc is most likely responsible for the success of Skid Row, you know, to a large degree. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, he took them a lot of places. Yeah. All the years you've been doing stuff, you've been in all kinds of different situations in your career. This is something I've asked other people, but have you ever had a situation where you were scared for your life? Like, oh, my God, I'm going to die in this studio? There was one German band that you guys don't know where... The guitar player, who by now passed away a long time ago, um, was a pretty tough guy. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and when I say that, that that meant, I don't know, left or right, which one the the wrong situation is. But he would come in, there would be a gun right on the on the console and a knife, and and the guy was actually really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that external thing, you know, was always like I I never was afraid for my life. No, I don't think there ever was something like that. Interesting question. Yeah. 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 You're not gonna ask well, me if he has a nice friendly I mean, story. You see some some <laughs> stuff, you know. Yeah. I walked in on on the first time I met Alice in the studio, uh, it was my birthday. And I walked in and there's Alice Cooper and he's got a knife like that, cotton the cake. <laughs> and he goes, You don't give Alice a knife like that. <laughs> but Alice was the coolest guy. I, I got. I got to imagine working with him was always a. Pleasure. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. He would get up at four in the morning, drive down to Laguna Beach, play golf, show up at the studio at one o'clock, do his vocals till about six, seven, go out and and rent three C class horror movies. The ones where you can see the strings. Yeah, the really yeah. bad and which ones. Would, uh, would watch all those in that same night and the next day would be exactly the same. And but he always was there to do his work and, and you know. Yeah. But Alice is it's just he's just a character. Yeah. You know, it's just like, wow. Super smart. So it's Ozzy. Yeah. And when you see that show, The Osbournes, you think he's a stupid ass. But he is not. He is super smart. He knows exactly what he wants to do. Yeah. Especially musically. Yeah. yeah. I think he gets a bit of a bad rap with the whole bumble yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. For well, sure. 20 million would do, I would uh, do a bad rap. Right. <laughs> you play up your eccentricity a little bit more than normal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, yeah, he's a smart guy. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. I will ask. Have you ever met Ace Fraley? No. When I did the uh, Randy Rhodes tribute album, uh, it was meant to be an Ozzy Osbourne tribute, tribute album. Okay. Uh, and I, I called up Ozzy, I told him which songs are on there, and, and, and I was planning on, well, I had a band play the whole album, mm-hmm. and I was going to replace the drums, replace the guitar, bass, everything with people that had worked with Ozzy. Okay. And he goes... I'm still alive, I, and and those are people I have worked with. I wouldn't feel right about this, mm. so I can't the whole thing. And then a week later, I get a call from East West Japan, and they say, "Can you do a Randy Rhodes tribute album?" And luckily, all those songs that we had recorded were songs that Randy Rhodes had played on on <laughs> Aussie rec- records. Okay. I go, okay. Yeah. So then I think we kept. The rhythm guitars, they were played by Kane Roberts mm-hmm. and then uh, Al Petrelli. Al Petrelli. Oh, Petrelli, yeah. 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 He He's in one too. version of it, yeah. I think. Okay. So Al Petrelli played a whole bunch of the rhythm guitars. Wolf Hoffman played some of the rhythm guitars. And then Kane Roberts played some of the rhythm guitars. And then I had the solos play. I had the tape send out, or people come by, and play the solo for that particular song. Okay. We had... Uh, Sebastian sang a few songs, Mark Slaughter sang a few songs, and then uh, the singer from Impelitary, Ro- Rob Rock. Yeah, Rob yeah, Rock. Rob was Rock. In and too. then uh, yeah. Jolene Turner. Oh, wow. You know, and, 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 and Joel was my favorite singer at the Great time. Singer. And, and uh, then I sent him out to have solos done, and we had Lynch do a solo. Chris and Pelletier did a solo, or a couple of solos, and, and a whole bunch of people. And Ace was one of them. Everybody got a certain amount to play the solo. Mm. Well, that's how it is on a record like yeah. that. Ace wanted like five times that amount. <laughs> uh. I got that amount. <laughs> yeah. And paid him the money. Uh-huh. And then it took, I think, seven weeks. And then I. All of a sudden, I hear from them. And by now, I had from the Japanese label, if we don't have the, the tapes by Monday, we want our money back. Oh, wow. So, and then get from Ace, I get uh, a message on my answering machine saying, look, my dad just died. I have to prepare for the KISS tour. Yeah, the farewell you tour. You know, and I cannot do that solo. 
and and then he sent the money back. He mm-hmm. sent the tapes back, and that was it. Well, at least he didn't keep the money. Yeah, well, he sent <laughs> the money back. <laughs> but yeah, that was mm-hmm. two thousand right right before the farewell tour because that's when his pa- his dad passed away. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I do remember the the Randy Rhodes tribute album too. Yeah, right here. That one. Yeah, I do remember wow. that. Goodbye to romance. Goodbye to romance. Roy Z. That's so ended cool. up being the guy. The tapes were already in in L.A., so Roy Z did it for me. Saved my ass. There's one from another one from Grayson. He submitted a lot of questions for you. Uh, with the popularity of DIY home recording, do you think that the lack of a producer is why there's so many lackluster artists and bands these days? Partly. Yeah. Partly. But the producer is the the sixth ear or the outside ear mm-hmm. that is not a member of the band that grew with all the songs. So you have a whole different view sometimes, you know, and, and, and uh, sometimes... Even the decision on which songs should go on the album uh, up to the producer and, and, you know, might be a different one than the band would make. Right. So, and, and uh, that outside opinion and that outside influence, I think is a good thing. Yeah. I'd say so, too. You know, that way you're not just coming in with, this is what we got, this is what we're doing, that's it. And there's nothing no else to that's going to give you an opinion on it unless yeah. it's on the street. Right. Well, yeah, cause By then it's too late. Because you're not yeah. emotionally tied to it like they no. are. Yeah. You can no. view it And I'm not tied to who wrote the song. Right. You know, mm-hmm. That's why I never wanted to know that. You know, uh, it comes from the band, fine, and that that's enough I, I need to know. So, yeah, I think uh, producer's influence can be very good. Yeah. It can also be bad. Yeah. You know, if the producer is not <clears throat> on one line with, with the band, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I suppose it can go either way. Yeah. We talked about Desmond Child a little bit earlier. You guys are both here in Nashville. You guys yeah. ever cross paths and hang out? Or Yeah, yeah. we did. Uh, we worked on that Kane Roberts record together. Yeah. We did a band together. was called, uh, oh, something X. Mm. Uh, oh, was it Rated X? Rated X. Yeah. It was uh, a it was Joe, young Joe, Joe boy Lynn, band. The, it was really uh, almost kids. Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking of the Joe Lynn Turner thing. And then he... Uh, Rated X was the name of the band, no, and well, he okay. wrote a lot of songs with them. We also did uh, the Rasmus together, mm-hmm. which is a Finnish band, okay. which I love that band, mm-hmm. you know. And and we worked on that record together, uh, uh, Ten Black Roses. Uh, so, so you've seen his studio in the Bank Vault over in West Nashville? No, no. we we that's where we interviewed him. I went to his out. house. In, oh, did you? Well, he he bought a bank branch building. And I remember seeing this building when I was growing up. And when he gave us the address, I pull up. I was like, this is a bank building. Yeah, it looks like a bank. And, like, the whole top floor where the tellers were is his office and his piano is there. And then he's like, go down to the bottom. We go downstairs, and it's where the bank vault is. And he built the studio inside of a bank vault. Wow. Yeah, And it was cool. so cool. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I was like, this is the weirdest place I've ever done an interview. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah he, lived in, he lived in West Nashville, I think. Yeah, I don't know where With he lives, his, but, yeah. Friend and and two kids. He yeah, they two, got kids. two kids. Yeah, yeah, and but very he's he's a freaking genius. Yeah. yeah, genius. I mean, look at all those songs. You know. Yeah, it's La a Vida massive. Loca. It's like, right. of course, of course, it's him. Yeah, that's the thing. He's he's written for so many different genres too. Yeah. It's it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he could take a rock band bonfire. and make them he something. He wrote a song for yeah. bonfire. He did. Sword and Stone, right? Sword and Stone. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Wasn't there a Kiss tie to that song, yeah, too? Yeah, Kiss did a demo of it, too. That's they right. They just didn't put it on the record. That's right. That was the... Ron Nevison didn't didn't want it on the record. I don't know why. Mm. But uh, And then it was on the soundtrack for... Uh, Shocker? Shocker, yeah. The old horror the movie, movie Shocker. from the 80s. Shocker. And Kane is in that. And Kane's in that. That's yeah, he's, right. He's an actor in that movie. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. And he, was, he <laughs> played on the soundtrack. It was him, Paul Stanley, Desmond Child, and oh, yeah. somebody else. They were called the Dudes of Wrath. And they did the title track. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But uh, I don't know. Just looking back on so many great albums and, you know, mm. thank you for all your contribution, yeah. man. I mean, well, of just, course. Yeah, you live. You do the best you can, you know, yeah, while you're right. at it. And you, you, <clears throat> in the moment, 
when you sit there and mixing master of puppets, you have no clue yeah. what's going to happen with that. You know, and it could go up and it could go down. This one went way up. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. It was fun. I went over there to Belgium. They invited me over to Belgium when they did the re-release of Master Puppets, that box set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and everybody that was involved with the they did that before a few times when they got nominated, you know, but then I never had time. But there I could fly over there and, and, and uh, uh, everybody got together. Yeah, and, and it was it was really cool, and it was weird after all those years. There's those kids, kids with like pimples, and <laughs> we're in the studio, and you know, and then you don't see them again, and they're multi, multi, multi millionaires, yeah, in the biggest band in the world. Know. Yeah, yeah, to this day, I'd yeah, say. unbelievable. Cool. Well, and that the one thing I appreciate about Metallica is that they really respect everyone that helped them get where they are and they, yeah. they seems like they do a great job celebrating their history no that's cool that they would bring you out for something like that which sounds like a family reunion for an album it did yeah it did it was basically so uh what's the next album you're working on it's like what's for lunch yeah <laughs> i'm working on a i want to talk about hair of the dog a little bit hair of the dog comes up in a time when grunge has already come and wiped out that kind of straightforward rock and it was roll. 99 right yeah i think yeah so like when a band like that's coming out had hair of the dog with that music and those albums come out like five years earlier i think they would have been huge they had everything you needed at that yeah. time but it was right up my alley their music right was up right alley. up my alley you know if i could i would have done that kind of music for the rest of my yeah. life you know isn't that another Desmond Child connection? Wasn't he a instrumental in bringing uh, him to Ruda you? Cepetis was the manager of Steve Vai, uh -huh. and her brother uh, was in the band. He yeah. was the guitar player. Yeah, John Cepetis. John Cepetis. And then Ryan, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I think I knew John when he was Desmond Child runner. Mm-hmm. And he delivered something to Scream Studios, and, and that's how we met before. Yeah. And, and, and then, you know, at some point, they wanted to work with me doing this record. And Ruda, Ruda is amazing. Mm -hmm. she, wrote, she stopped being a manager, and she wrote three uh, bestseller books. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh unbelie unbelievable. Yeah. She's amazing. Nice person and, 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 you know, very, very smart. Yeah. She had the band The Lit or Lit. Lit, yeah. Yeah. And then Steve Vai and um, Hair of the Dog. One of my favorite stories to tell about that band is I was in central Wisconsin, you know, way up far away from anything else popular going on. And Hair of the Dog came up there. They were opening for... I want to say Cinderella, and something happened to Tom Kiefer's voice. He couldn't play that night. And so they thought, okay, show's canceled. They're hanging out back in the hotel. The promoter calls and goes, no, you guys need to come down here and play. And so they're going to just do the whole show. So they come out, and they basically do more than fill in for Cinderella. They build themselves a huge fan base in this small you know, <laughs> section of Wisconsin to the point where there was a record store called Inner Sleeve, I believe it's still there, in a town called Wausau, Wisconsin. And you'd go in there and he would have a list up on the door that said like the top selling albums of the week out of that store. So you'd look up there and it'd be like Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Corn, Stone Temple Pilots. But number one was Hair of the Dog. <laughs> Just in that time capsule kind of a place. Yeah. And they became huge to the people up there, you know, where they went from, I don't know what they were doing everywhere else because it wasn't the time for that kind of music, but man, they were getting airplay all the time on the local radio station where I worked. They, you know, people wanted them to come back to town to play. They could then come by themselves and play and they became massive. Mm -hmm. But just that weird timing where that was just like a, a isolated incident at that time. 2000. It was 2000. Yeah. 
Because I met Tina in 99, and she was already here when we did Hair of the Dog. Yeah? Yeah. Love that yeah. stuff, man. Yeah, his... I love that band. It was, uh, and his voice, uh -huh. you know, he he should have been the guy in Van Halen. Yeah. After, you know, who, who, what's his name left, you know? <coughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. Boy, that would, I never thought about that before. That yeah, would have been great. Yeah, he actually ran into Eddie at a gas station. I love yeah. that story. Yeah. 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 That's a great story. Yeah. Ryan, yeah. Ryan's great guy. He is. I love him. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh. Heather, you you saw probably the new record that they just put out. Yeah, I've got, yeah. Which is I've got the vinyl. All the old stuff, right? right? Yeah, I bought the vinyl. It's beautiful yeah. packaging. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Love yeah, we remixed some stuff for it, I think, and and yeah, <coughs> that's when I still had a studio. Yeah. <laughs> now you just have a room. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is gonna be an Airbnb, man. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So they can we spoil that a little bit? So like. If Wire World Studio is not completely going away, it's going to be turned into an Airbnb. You can, as long as you don't show any pictures. Okay. You know, I don't, this looks, that is the thing that hits me hard. When I look at that, I go, so it's a world-class studio. Oh, yeah. well. So that, that makes me. No, but I just wanted to give people a preview because we'll help promote it once you get it yeah, up and running. Because yeah, yeah. there's a lot of listeners that would probably want to come and spend a night here. Sure, right. yeah. Because if right. you're coming to Nashville to come on vacation and do the music speak, thing, and come sit out. This is going to be one bedroom, yeah. so where better kids, to stay? They can stay on the couch there, yeah. but that's it. Not more than four people, right? You know, and everybody has said, I'd stay there. Absolutely, yeah. you know? I'd live. 30 minutes away and I'll stay here. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can, you can mention it. I just don't want to see any yeah. pictures. Because it's now it's like in between yeah, yeah. two I planets. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I was saying I'd like to rent this out one night and just bring my laptop and make copies of all your CDs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all going to be gone. I mean, the chefs are going to be there. Yeah. And leave it as original as possible. Yeah. You, know, you can so still tell what go, it was. Oh, that's where they worked all this time. Right, yeah. And this was a special place. Yeah. You know? Well, know. you've definitely earned the, the break now. You yeah. Know? You've definitely given so much, so many great albums over the years. And you, and can, you don't forget that if you're doing this as a producer, you work 12, 15 hours a day. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. Sundays every day for months. You know, and vacation is when you travel from Chicago to L.A., <laughs> that's your day off. Yeah. You know, so uh, I, I want to catch up on it. that. Yeah. You know, I want to catch up on vacations a little bit, see see the world. Of course, now I just nailed myself down with, with that machine up front. You know? <laughs> but... Uh, so there's no chance that in, in a year we're going to see a post on Facebook going, here's the new band I'm working with. No. Okay. <laughs> well, unless it, would, unless it's the, be, the Vito Brada band. Yeah. Yes. That, that would uh, be an exception. It would have to be, you know, there would not my, not many bands be where I would come out of retirement. From, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, and it would have to be very, very special to me. Yeah. Like Vito. Yeah. You know, and, or if Angus Young would come and say, hey, "Yeah, well, maybe that would be already a maybe." Vito would be a for sure, but I also know for sure that he's not going to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, hmm. well, th uh, we're honored to get the opportunity to be your last interview. That's the last yeah. one. <laughs> and thank That's you for thank one. you for and letting us do the this. second last. Yeah, you know, we did ninety minutes. And, well, uh, we beat that today. <laughs> yeah, gladly. Well, that's what I said. I can do all afternoon, you know. Well, we truly so, appreciate it. Yeah. And, you know, just to say from myself and Chris and from the people, the kind of people that listen to our show, thank you, Michael Wagner. Of course. You know, all these You're albums welcome. throughout the years, so every single one of them, you know, and it's a trip to me to think when we started this, that one day we'd get to meet somebody like you, somebody that's had such a huge impact on our lives, somebody that's had such a huge impact on rock music history, and we get to sit and pick your brain. You've always been more than kind to us, and we love you, man. Thank we you, love guys. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.